You're watching streamers. They and, call themselves streamers. Okay, so what's esports? Esports is professional streamers. They're so good that they're entering tournaments for money. Right. And that was I mean, the thing. That is I, the thing. I used to think that was crazy, but I watch people fish. So that's weird too, <laughs> right? It's not right. It's not that it's totally crazy. It's that I think the size that that market was going to grow to was overstated by the presence of people like Bob Kraft and other sports billionaires buying and funding teams. Yeah. I thought people thought that that meant it would grow to be the size of the NFL. I never believed that. It's a niche thing. If you turn on TV at the right time of day and the right channel, you could run into professional ping pong. That doesn't mean it's <laughs> economically a big deal. Right. So. I was really bored one night and I watched a professional cornhole tournament. <laughs> And I was curious, like, what the prize money was. Yeah, those guys was. are not kidding around either. No. And, like, every single one of the beanbags went in. And I was amazed. But then, you know, the first prize for the winner of the entire tournament was, like, dinner and a movie. <laughs> it was, wasn't much. <laughs> I was amazed. But they're I very think you good can, at it. You can only play cornhole with a drink in one hand because it, balance, <laughs> it balances you. It's like the ultimate backyard sport. Um, you know what I, I think should come back is uh, bocce ball. You ever play bocce? I have. That's one of the most fun activities to do with a drink in your hand. Is that like also. a boca sport? It's like an it's like an Italian grandfather sport, but yeah. it is if you have a drink in your hand, you're at your at your Italian friend's home who happens to have a bocce court, it is maybe the most fun thing in the world. You hear a lot of oh Yeah, a lot of oh. But it's more fun than horseshoes. And uh, because it's a little bit like bowling. You guys are veering increasingly far away from my areas of expertise. <laughs> yeah, sorry. All right. All right, so you put out, and we're, we're the a big topic of the conversation of the show today is your 2024 outlook, which you right. titled Pillow Talk. Very cute bears on this. Um, and I just want to give you some respect that you deserve. In, in this, in the open, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Asset and Wealth Management, Mary Callahan Erdos, wrote the intro. She said, as we head into the new year, we want you to know what a privilege it is to serve as your advisor. We work very hard each day to bring you the best of J.P. Morgan. No one, don't blush, no one exemplifies this better than Michael Sembalist, my investment partner, who guides all of us with his deeply researched and insightful perspectives. That is almost certainly AI generated. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's we true. We have a Mary bot. That was written by Chat JPM. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly. a shame. It was so beautiful. It's yeah. true. So J.P. Morgan, uh, Assets under supervisory. It's a big number. It's so it's it's three trillion. It's four. It's it's got a T. It's that's a lot of money. Trillion, yeah. That's a lot of money. I think it's one of the biggest pools of supervised assets in the world. Yeah. Like without it it would creating a compliance issue, like it's safe to say that's got to be a top ten, right? Right. Now there's okay. a lot of cash in there, and you know, of course, things like that, and it, you know, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, of course. state and corporate pension plans. It's a very diverse funding base. Lo right. You could you could punt on this question, but if you want to suck up to your boss, Josh and I were talking about this. I don't know a couple months ago, just how dominant J.P. Morgan is relative to your peers. It is really remarkable, and I think I asked Josh if Jamie Dimon went somewhere else, would he have had the same effect? Probably. Had he gone to Wells Fargo, would Wells Fargo be J.P. Morgan? Wells Fargo didn't have the, you know, prime brokerage business, the, the heritage derivatives businesses, the investment banking franchise. I mean, it was kind of a marriage of a lot of good things all at once. But giant bank XYZ, would he have had the same impact? If it, not not specific so. to Wells, but yeah. I think so. I've been, I joined J.P. Morgan 37 years ago. Wow. And I've worked in and around and closely with every chairman we've had. He's that good? Yeah. Oh, no, it's, it's, but, but it's almost hard to, it, it's almost embarrassing when I think about some of the people that used to run the Morgan Bank in the 90s and how they stack up to, to what Jamie does. I was going to say, like, also, a lot of people don't have the context to remember uh, the bank under his predecessor, Harrison. Was the well, Bill Harrison was from, from Chase. Okay, right. But, like, J.P. Morgan now is considered like the Yankees. It wasn't always it was, It was not. But a lot of people that have come into the industry in the last 10 years, 15 years, they just, they don't really understand that. Here, here's the way I always think about it, was at the time that J.P. Morgan and Chase merged, J.P. Morgan probably had, let's say, had 17 to 18 core businesses yeah. and had a leading market position in three of them. 
right. which would have been asset management, European M&A, okay. and um, interest rate and credit derivatives. That's it. And okay on certain things, but you know we were nowhere in the equity market league tables and M&A league tables in the 90s. Right. And it took a long time to build that. Some of that took place before Jamie joined, but most of it took place. And I can tell you, when people present in front of Jamie, they are preparing and sweating and analyzing more in, you know, intensely than for any other chairman that has ever run the bank. So this- and that's over and above anything else, that's part of the value that he brings because he's smart enough to know when people are coming to present to him, he can figure out like this, what, have you prepared? Is the information correct? Is this person saying something inconsistent from that person? Have you thought about the implications for the risk book? I'm sorry. Are we compensated people? <laughs> I remember seeing during the um, during the Packers Cowboys game, playoff game a Amazing. couple weeks ago. Yeah, sorry. At halftime, they showed Jimmy Johnson and they asked him, "Would you give us?" an example of the halftime speech that you'd give to the Cowboys. Now they're down 27, six or something. And it was, and it was really intense, yeah. right? Yeah. That's kind of how people prepare for when they're meeting with Jamie. And that's how you have to run the, one of the largest banks in the world with 250,000 so people. I tell this to, I tell this to Michael and my partner, Chris, all the time. They don't understand I'm it. rolling my eyes preemptively. They don't understand whatever it. You're about they to don't, say. The intensity that I bring to certain um, situations, say, I feel like they underappreciate how important it is in that moment to come with that level of intensity. Everything it's chill it's out, not, Josh. It's not about, chill out, Josh, it's not about all the, the time. It's not about the, the decibel level. It's about the concentration, the focus, yeah. and holding people accountable for what they do. Jamie would hold you accountable. No, Jamie would respect <laughs> the way that I lead this organization is what I'm trying to – is what what Michael Sembolist and I are trying to tell you <laughs> is that um, one of the things that was really interesting that I heard being discussed this week in banking – uh, just as an aside, but I just love to get a quick comment from you. There's this concept where the only stocks in the market where the fundamentals can actually be altered by the share price are the, you know, backwards basically are the banks. So when you see New York Community Bank tumbling, it's not that it automatically guarantees that the fundamentals of the bank will get worse, it's that it can. It's hard to really make that case. For like, so the share yes, price is it's, it's purely a function of the fact that it's a deposit taking institution, right? And when the stock price goes down on any other company, it doesn't necessarily mean that the customers of that company that's exactly right. are in worse shape. Now, thank There's God, there's no such thing as a non investment grade bank. That's right. So, thank so, thank God, uh, New York Community Bank said they're not seeing anything going on with deposits, which is great because their share, their uh, depositors are not sitting on Twitter all day the way the SVB guys were, right. but. <laughs> It works in the in the reverse direction. The better your share price is or the more valuable your bank is, the better the fundamentals get also. And from my perspective as a JP Morgan shareholder, that's what I feel Jamie Dimon has done at JPM that maybe the other CEOs of his era didn't do. So JP Morgan is now like the most valuable, most profitable, et cetera, et cetera. That actually has an ameliorating effect on its fundamentals because more people want to do business there. So it works in both directions. Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's a lot of people that are accountable for the firm's success, of right? But but Jamie, you know, over the last 18 months was personally, you know, from my perspective, <clears throat> very involved in a lot of the successful risk decisions that got made. And um, let's talk about Signature for a minute. Let's talk about First Republic. Let's talk about Silicon Valley Bank. Those banks were flooded with deposits in 2000, 2021, and basically bought the longest duration securities and yeah. loan portfolios they could possibly do at 1% on the 10 year. Whoops. And it took it took discipline to say we're not working we're not gonna do that. And you know, the people that run our investment bank in concert with Jamie basically held their dry powder and were patient until the yield curve kind of went back up. This is the first credit cycle I've ever seen in the banking industry driven by interest rate mismatch instead of bad loans, mm. right? That's basically what did in Silicon Valley Bank was a massive interest rate mismatch. And and it's, uh, now it's, people, all, it, it's people, all derived from that decision that you made. People don't understand. People say, what do you, they bought the longest duration asset. What, why would they do that? Well, there's a reason. It's a self-interested reason. It's more profits if it doesn't blow up. Yeah. which means bigger bonus, 
it, like everything comes back to incentives. And if you work at a mid-sized bank, you want to make more money. Yeah, I think there are some. I think there are some questions about OCC oversight. Of course, um, some of the deals that were made exempted some of those medium-sized banks from some of the oversight provisions. I think that if you look back at the experience of some of the uh, asset liability people put in charge at SVB, I don't think you would say that that experience level stacks up resume by resume with some people who do it at other banks. There are some questions there. You know, there there is a, there's a lot of legitimate questions to ask about yes. it. Here's what I think is interesting about SVB. And by the way, just a quick comment on um, New York Community Bank. Let, let's kind of put that in a separate bucket. They had significant exposure to New York. We're going to do that later in the show, for sure. Which is different. For sure. But, you know, when you think about um, Silicon Valley Bank, in the long history of FDIC resolutions, uninsured depositors take a hit almost all the time, right? And we, we documented this. We were expecting some kind of loss sharing where the, you know, the average account balance at SVB was a million dollars. Yeah. The average uninsured account balance at SVB was $4 million. Mm -hmm. If there was ever a time for the administration and the OCC and the Treasury and the FDIC to, to, to live up to Geithner's promise of no more bailouts, Th that was a poster child for where uninsured depositors should have taken some kind of hit. And A, they took zero hit. So now how can you not bail out any uninsured depositor in any other bank after you kind of build out the VC community who invested in, who were depositors of that bank? Second, remember what they did at the Fed. For the first time in the Fed's history, they accepted collateral from banks where you could post collateral and borrow it and borrow more than its market value. They would allow you to post a bond has a par of 100, worth 80, they'll lend you 100. First time in the history of the Federal Reserve. So while there are risks in the regional banks and some of the community banks, I think that the regulators and the administration have made it clear they're going to ring fence things as soon as they pop I, up. I said it at the time, no vote in Congress. We just literally made FDIC insurance unlimited forever because yeah. what would ever be the reason why you would say – these people aren't as worthy as the venture capitalists at Silicon Valley Bank. Right. right. They, they have, that can't happen. I can't believe they boxed themselves in like Well, they would have had 2,000 banks go under. Yeah, they had to do that. Well, Otherwise, there would be no more regional banks. Un unclear. Your, your, we'll never your, know. your bank would have 70% uh, market share in the wake of that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what they wanted either. All right, we so, ready to start the show? Where's John? Oh, uh, we got Daniel in the seat. We got All right, Daniel, Daniel the seat. There we Look go. At this. Nicole, what show is it? Oh. <laughs> John didn't set me up. Hang on. Time out. That's why we need John. Oh. I feel, oh. Uh, I, I feel almost naked here. How, how Josh long is, is pressing the buttons how long and we're not hearing the sounds. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Compound and Friends. Is the show starting now? Or now we're starting, starting, starting now like we're 15 starting. minutes ago. Starting officially. My team let me down, Michael. Hey, everybody. Exciting news from our friends at public.com and the public trading app. They have just launched options trading. And in an industry first, public is sharing 50% of its options revenue directly with you, the customer. So in other words, when you trade options on public, you actually get something back. Nicole. Josh. What do you think about that? I think that sounds absolutely fantastic, don't you? Yeah, well, it's pretty generous, right? Absolutely. By sharing 50% of their options revenue, you'll know exactly how much public makes from your options trades, and that's because they're giving you half of it. So it's transparency and maybe some money back. Follow the link in the show description or visit public.com to learn more. This has been paid for by Public Investing. Must activate options account by March 31st for revenue share. Options not suitable for all investors and carry significant risk. Full disclosures and podcast description, U.S. members only. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. There will be a Why Jamie Diamond. What would Jamie do? There will be a Jamie Diamond esque meeting taking place uh, after the show today. All right. Hi, guys. It's your boy, Downtown Josh Brown. I'm here with Michael Batnick, my co host. And this is another all new edition of The Compound and Friends. We have a very special guest today, returning champion. Michael Sembalist is the chairman of market and investment strategy for J.P. Morgan Asset Management. 
and the author of Eye on the Market since 2005. Michael is also a member of the J.P. Morgan Asset Management Investment Committee. Michael has spent 37 years at J.P. Morgan, joining the firm in 1987. Michael Sembolis, welcome back to the show. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's, truly, it's truly a pleasure. We're so excited about this. Uh, we read all your stuff. I know you know that. Uh, how, how have things been? What's, what's, uh, what's been your, your uh, 2024 experience like so far? It's only February. I know, but, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, um, and the market's more of the same, you know. Yeah, that was surprising. Yep. It was, it was more of the same, but even more, even more so. Yeah. So I, I would I would have thought that we would have had, like, uh, maybe a pause. Well, let me, Not let, yet. let me take us back to the future. Okay. Michael was on uh, last July. And since then, the S&P is up 13%. The Qs are up uh, 16%. The 10-year was three on the day of taping. Hit a cycle high of almost almost 5%. Now we're back at 410 or so. You said that the market was pricing in 150 to 200 basis points of cuts. And that's where the market is off sides. Where are we now? I still think that's too much, right? But the fact, I mean, the, part of the part of the rally in the fourth quarter wasn't the magnitude of the cuts, but that it was that the the hikes weren't going to happen anymore, right? I mean, ha- for how many months have we been reading about the the metaphysical certainty of a recession based on one indicator of an inverted yield curve, right? There was all of this other stuff going on that I wrote about right after I was on your show in, in August that was not suggestive of a recession. And then our, the outlook that we put out in January was all about all of the things that were directly non-recessionary. Yeah. But I think, you know, the primary the primary driver of this market rally has been the fact that the Fed is going to be easing rather than cutting. When that is and how many cuts, I don't know. Uh, but then secondly, nothing is really being d- done to stop the kind of irrevocable margin expansion of those se- top seven, 10 stocks with the exception of the buzzsaw that Tesla's running. It's like so the can, perfect combination. Let, so let me quote you on that. And we'll do we'll do rate cut expectation stuff later. You said the MAG7 rally has been earnings driven, not relying on multiple expansion. Of the group's 28% return since 2019, uh, 21% is attributable to sales growth, 6% for margin Margins. expansion. And one percent for multiple expansion. The twenty eight percent is what these stocks rallied into, or, or after got killed in twenty twenty two. They had rallied a lot in twenty twenty one. Now they came all the way back. Right. Some I decided of them are to higher. kind of roll the yeah, clock yeah. back a bit. Uh, but over that broader time horizon, this is the anti nineteen ninety nine two thousand rally, which so, was all about PE expansion, nothing on margins, very little on sales growth. So here's your here's your data. You got 14% sales growth in the Mag Seven uh, last quarter. That's versus the S and P 493, two percent. Okay, so that explains some of the outperformance. It's not completely irrational. Uh, you got uh, 23% profit margins for these companies. The S and P standard is like nine percent and going higher and going higher. Yeah. Um, that explains some of the outperformance. And then uh, PE multiple. It's 30 versus 18. It's important that to say it's not 30 versus 10. So everything is elevated relative to like that golden 15, 16 everybody wants. But guess what? 30 seems fair for these companies. What should they trade at? Uh, one of the, th- you know, one of the simple techniques that people use is to say, well, let me take the PEs and then I'm going to adjust each one of them by the P-E-G. long term. Yeah, the long term growth expectations. Right. Once you do that, the multiples kind of look more similar to each other. What's What's really fascinating is in in 99-2000, it was all about like, when are people going to wake up from this fever dream, right? And and everybody knew that it was a fever dream, which is a question of how long it would last. This time, it's not that. It's not a fever dream at all. It's real. And now the question is, when is the DOJ, the FTC, and the politicians, when will they have had enough of this kind of power concentration that will drive them to aggressive. They have had enough. They don't have the they don't have the backing. Lena Khan has had enough. She came into office having had enough. Yeah. But she doesn't have what she needs to to get anything done there, here. I would say that we're pretty close on Google and Amazon. Hang on, before before we get yeah, into the DOJ ahead. stuff, I just want to stick to to what's going on today. So Please do. somebody showed me this great chart 
It's the price of sales. This is from Brent Donnelly on Twitter. It's the price to sales ratio going all the way back to the pre-dot-com uh, era of uh, information technology sector. And then it shows you the operating margins. And this is uh, this was a lot of hope. And that's not what we're experiencing today. Right. These are some frighteningly profitable companies. And I put it this way. One sign of how profitable they are, these, these tech companies are the ones paying seven to nine hundred dollars a ton to offset their carbon footprints because they because they don't care. Yeah. Because they can afford it. Yeah. Right? They're the ones doing direct air carbon capture, enhanced weathering. It doesn't matter. Their carbon footprints are small and they make tons of money. Yeah. Like no, there it's not a proxy because no, but no other a company could afford to be doing that, but it's just an interesting sign of just how profitable. Why do you are. think we're getting close on? Because my my understanding is that the challenge of winning anything in an antitrust uh, debate over Amazon, Google, is that the other side just says, "Well, the consumer likes it this way," and there are a lot of arguments for why that's true. Amazon is de facto helping the consumer, which is probably why there's no energy behind any of these these battles. And I don't think there's anybody that's a user of Gmail that says, man, I wish this were totally disconnected from my favorite search engine. Right. Well, at the end of last year, yeah, um, and you guys probably know more about this than me. But, I got uh, it. <laughs> no, but it's, uh, you know, um, Epic Games won a jury trial yep. against Google. Because Google, what Google had been doing, let's say you're playing Fortnite, and I, I learned this from my son, you can play Fortnite as Peter Griffin. Now, why anybody would want to do that and pay for the privilege of doing literally that, does that is mysterious. <laughs> yes. Me. Okay. But if you want to play Fortnite as Peter Griffin, you have to pay an in-app purchase for that. That in-app purchase on an Android phone must go through the Google Play Store. That's right. There is absolutely no other venue or mechanism for making that payment to, to, to Epic, and Google Play Store takes 30%. They lost a jury trial on that. Um, but Apple, Apple, but won Apple beat them in a judge trial. Okay. Now, if somebody is suing just for a, for a legal determination, it goes to a judge. But once damages are involved, then the jury's got to be there. So I, I I think the tide's turning a little bit. As res with respect to Amazon, you want to sell you to you want to get in front of prime sellers. You have to use Amazon fulfillment services. Okay. Like, Here, when when the financial services industry does that, it's called tying. The you can't do it. But the but the counter argument is Amazon says we allowed this to go on without our fulfillment and logistics, and it was an absolute nightmare for customers. They didn't receive their stuff. Right. They got the wrong stuff. It showed up late. It showed up damaged. So actually, we have to force these third party sellers to use our logistics because it's our customer that it's our relationship with our customer uh, I understand that gets all damaged. The, I understand all the arguments. Nothing goes, nothing grows forever. Sure. And the, the political dynamics start to come into play here too. Yeah. Right? There's, there's, there's a point where, and the same thing happened a couple of in 1999, it happened in the late 60s. You get to a point where a handful of companies represent such a dominant part of of overall market power that all of a sudden things start to happen. And so, so but Apple invented this basically, the App Store. Mm -hmm. Started from nothing. Now this chart that you have, they're now, it's now it's now pushing up on 90 billion dollars in revenue, which is just a kind of a hilarious number. Right. So what what would be a reasonable outcome for the courts if they were to rule against? Is it hey, these 30% numbers are punitive, take it down to 20%? Like where does No, this you go? have you have to you have to provide, well, at least for the Android phones, you'd have to, you know, provide an open venue for other ways of making in-app purchases. So they, uh, sorry. Right. Fort, Fortnite would have to, like, have another way they could sell a skin to a user right. that circumvents the Google Play Store if they want to be able to. That's right. Okay. And then, you know, with respect to Amazon, it would be some kind of accommodation where they where everybody would not be forced to use uh, Amazon fulfillment services to, to just to get in front I, of the prime customer. So I'm really sympathetic to Amazon on this. Right. Here's a way you don't have to use Amazon logistics. Buy from Walmart. Don't sell it in their store. Don't be a third-party seller on their platform. And by the way, good luck. I don't know. I feel like that's – they built that, it. They're – you know, shelf space, shelf space payments have been legal forever. 
Yeah. Um, you know, hostess can go in and do shelves payments. And and the argument as to why that's okay is because go sell at some other supermarket. Yeah. What starts to happen is that you, the Sherman Act comes into play when there is nowhere else to go or when someone is such a dominant player in that marketplace. They're not. Look at Walmart's e-commerce business. Right. It's growing twice as fast as Amazon's. They are just not. And the analogy that this is John D. Rockefeller – and he's buying up the railroads, and he's jacking up the shipping costs to the smaller Amazon? oil producers. <laughs> I am. I am. <laughs> We're everyone in this world is long Amazon right. at this point. Okay, to some extent, still a right. percent of retail sales. Amazon's under under twenty, I think. They, they are. They're. Do, yes. They have dominant mind share in a lot of ways. That's definitely true. And no one's going to say that they're like a B player. Right. But they don't completely control all e-commerce and Shopify. Yes is the best example of why there already is an alternative. Yep. If you want to sell on your own, Shopify gives you as good or better tools than Amazon shipping and fulfillment uh, gives I, you. I, I don't have a horse in the race. Yeah. I'm just looking at this. Totally. And saying, I don't see anything endogenous to those businesses that's going to slow down this machine. Yeah. Right? It's scary. No, it's scary. And I so agree. now here's another one. Um, and, and I think this is well known, but- NVIDIA recently switched all of its semiconductor production to TSMC and got rid of the little piece they had left with Samsung. And if you look at wafer production, one of the ways that you can evaluate wafer production is in, in a wafer, producti or wafer productivity yield. It's 10 to 20% at Samsung. It's 80% to TSMC. What does that mean? Uh, it's, it's the... It's the it's essentially a capacity utilization measure of when you produce how how much of the production is actually you know perfectly functional as built based on its so, original design. So TSMC was better than Samsung, oh, like by by okay. factor of four. Okay, and, and so you know when we're looking at Nvidia, one of the issues that you have to keep in mind is that there is no there's no backup plan for where they'd be sourcing their chips for their GPUs from if and when anything should ever happen. In well, Taiwan. the backup plan is they're building a $40 billion facility outside of Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. Those fabs It'll are going to come years. On, Those fabs it. are going to come online. I get it. In three, four years, they're going to already be a generation behind when they come online and they're going to cost three to five times more than the chips that are, that are, that are produced in Taiwan. And that comes from Morris Chang, who's the CFO. Yeah. It's, the, yeah. I mean, the concentration there arguably that could shut down the global economy. If right. we can't get chips out of out of that region, right. it's very, very problematic. I mean, and if you want, later in the show, we can kind of talk about some of the war game analysis that's been done on a Chinese invasion of Taiwan and whether the U.S. Inf gets involved and do they get helped out by the Japanese defense forces and all that kind of stuff. We'll get there. But before we do, I, I'd yeah. be curious to hear your take. We speak about concentration all the time. Are you – I'm not – forget about market breadth or anything like that or maybe market breadth, I guess. Are you nervous? So you have a chart showing that it's the highest stock market concentration since the early 1970s based on the Herfin dollar. I forget the name it's of It's just the sum of the squared weights. Okay. It's just – it's simple. So, so – does that concern you when you think about just purely from the lens, forget about the economy or anti-competitive, from the lens of the S&P 500, does this worry you? I don't think it necessarily makes life more difficult for one of those S&P 4, you know, 493 companies, right? It, it, it doesn't affect their profitability in any way. I don't think it negatively affects their margins. But what it means is if something goes wrong, with one of those big companies, it has a much bigger ripple effect on the market than, than it used to. And also all things being equal, I, I would rather live in a world where, where you know, the, the, the sum of these weights is not as high as it is right now. Here's a counterpoint. Tesla, and I know Tesla is its own animal. Tesla is in a really nasty drawdown right yep. now. Um, but even in 2022, so granted, it wasn't a great time for the market. But Amazon was down 50%. I think Google was down 45. Meta was down 70 plus. So was Netflix. We had a period of time where the giant stocks got creamed. Mm -hmm. And the S&P fell 25%. I don't mean to minimize it, but that's a garden variety bear market. You know, it's a kind of pot holy garden variety bear market, right? A garden I mean, to me, a garden variety bear market is 15 to 20%. You know, by the time you're talking 25%, I mean, if we look... At the, the, the well, duration counts too. It was yeah. in a twenty five percent drawdown for fifteen minutes. Yeah, I mean, it's not like we suffered two years down twenty five percent. Right. So it was another V. 
Yeah. <laughs> we all said this one won't be a V. Of course right. it was. Yep. Right. Uh, I wanted to ask you, in the, in the early 1970s example, those companies were not uh, doing as many things as these concentrated companies are. And does that count for something? So somebody would look at the Nifty 50 example and say, okay, you had huge concentration. You had Coca-Cola, Kodak, uh, Xerox, IBM, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oh, wait, it was two stocks. I think it was AT&T and GE. That's that were, the 1950s. They were, no, no, no. They were 14% of the market at that peak. Early 70s? Two of them. The two of them. Are you sure about that? 50-50. Uh, All right. And remember, part of the other reason so. that was taking place in the early 70s is some of those companies were uh, – Obviously not the consumer stocks, but some of the, like GE, some of the other companies were benefiting from the Vietnam War spending. So there was some, so that was a part of it. So, so I think our companies in our, in the analog is we had a war on COVID and it looks like, a, like when you look at the government spending and the mobilization, it looks like a war. Um, we fought the war by making sure every kid had a brand new laptop, but functionally like for the, for the economy, the question is, the, the key, is this a key distinction or is it irrelevant those companies that were we were so concentrated in in the early 70s were not as dynamic as these profit margins nowhere near and none of them were expanding horizontally the way that these companies that we're talking like about Amazon has eight fortune 500 companies that it runs in, inside of it so does that count for does that mean it's really so. less concentrated I, I think so okay. I mean I, the the margin dynamism of these stocks is remarkable yeah um, they're extremely well run. Their labor to capital ratios are all really low. I mean, they there there are there's not a lot of arrows that you can throw here, um, other than that you know their their valuations are are a little bit high relative to their earnings and cash flow dynamics. Um, I, I think the risk for these companies are almost all exogenous to themselves, meaning like Me, some event whether it's whether it's okay antitrust. Pillar two taxation in Europe, right? I mean, that's where the, the Europeans are kind of getting closer and closer and closer to this pillar two tax regime where if they don't feel – where they can essentially be a, be a – do, do an arrest, like a tax arrest and go and, and take money away from Amazon in Italy if they think that Amazon is not paying enough taxes in Germany. Right. right. And the, the pillar two taxation thing is pretty scary because it, it creates all sorts of extraterritorial uh, disadvantages for U.S. companies. And I'm hoping that it doesn't go through. But it's, so, it's so funny. They'll pass that law and they'll be cheering in the streets as they go into year 40 of their recession. <laughs> it's, it's so wonderful. Right. Uh, I, I, I'm curious. I'm curious if you think a risk that maybe we're not thinking about in these companies is that they eat each other alive on A.I., and they go into like a U.S. versus Soviet style arms race, Microsoft, Azure versus AWS versus right. well, we do, uh, we, Google we do, Gemini, and we, margins start to fall. We, we do know that that the cloud companies are trying to get into the businesses of some of the other ones, and yeah. and OpenAI has been talking about you know competing with. Um, with NVIDIA and, and, and setting up chip fabs. They can't all win and have 23% profit margins, Pro probably. <laughs> right. There's a lot of money being spent. The other, the other thing I would say is, and, and we're still in the ascent of this AI arms race. We had a conference last week and, and the CEO of NVIDIA was there. And it's an amazing company. Yeah. And they have amazing people. But he was asked in the next two to three years, how are our lives, practically speaking, going to be changed by generative AI and large language models? And I was, I was kind of surprised at how non-committal that answer was. And what was the answer? Well, I don't know. No, it was okay. more than that, but it wasn't something that would rise to the level of importance of you know the interstate high the you know the the uh, interstate highway system in the yeah, United space States, travel, the something. internet. Yeah. yeah. Um, Electrification of U.S. farming, you know, the three biggest productivity shifts in the United States over the last hundred years. Copilot, right, uh, is the programming tool. It's incredible at that. And some crazy number, whether it's 40 to 60 percent of all code now, is, 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 is used or edited uh, through Copilot, which is this large language model tool. Is your team using all that stuff? Um, we'll get to that. Um, uh, customer service agents. Very helpful for customer service agents. Did you watch Curb uh, this weekend? No. I didn't see it yet. Okay. No spoilers. He's no spoilers. yelling at Siri. 
So yeah. that you've got, then you've got people, you, banks using it for fraud detection. You've got people using it for, you know, to generate kind of middle school level content for, for bad e-magazines, right? So yeah, there's a lot of individual use cases. Um, a, fr a friend of mine runs a law of one of the big New York law firms. They're using it to start, they've trained it on a law database and they can generate first draft interrogatory summer judgments and pleadings. And then the associates clean it up after the fact. But as I start adding up all these little pieces, it's not, it's not forming into some kind of economy-wide throw weight that lives up to a lot of the expectations. And so I'm, I'm waiting to see LIDAR, self-driving cars, level five, nowhere. Relying on radio, you know, relying on this stuff to do your radiology MRI interpretation, no thanks. Um, uh, we asked GPT-4 70 questions from the eye on the market. On, on politics, finance, energy, and economics. Got half of them right, got half of them completely wrong with all sorts of bizarre hallucinations. <laughs> um, and since you don't know what questions it's gonna get wrong, you have to double check the answer on everything. So- So you get to double the work. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what it was. The future's for, here. For yeah, us, but AI. For us. So there are, there are some, there are gonna be some fantastic applications of this stuff but I'm waiting to see how it, it comes to form. And, and I'm just reminded, I know it's not the same, but three years ago, if I were here, you guys would have been asking me questions about the metaverse and I would have been holding my nose. I know? would have also, Michael will tell you, I also would have been holding my nose. Okay, so, you know, we'll see. I, by the way, then there's the other competitive issue that there are, you know, meta basically released a free language model. Yeah. Hang on, my digital real estate is up four hundred percent. I'm only willing to believe that if you were given, if the, if somebody gave you to for nothing. So I want to go into I want to go into that. You you talk about this idea that ownership of an LLM itself is not necessarily that big a deal economically because of the way that domain specific tasks have been handled just as well by a very general LLM as they have by a domain specific LLM. Like you, like uh, the, the example that you gave, maybe you can explain to the viewers, sure. but Bloomberg like spent a lot of money building a finance specific LLM. And then you said what? Well, what was it about a million hours, George? It, it was a million hours of GPU time to create this thing called Bloomberg GPU. How, how expensive is that? A million hours of tr uh, training. Uh, GPU chips. One percent of GDP. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's going to be seven trillion dollars. Hundreds of thousands of dollars, at least, in just in power generation. Okay, costs. but so they built it. They built it. Okay. Um, then, what's fascinating is, despite Microsoft's relationship with OpenAI, Microsoft took Meta's free large language model called Llama off the shelf, downloaded it, and spent what was reportedly a hundred dollars <laughs> and trained it on some other raw data on finance, biomedicine, and law, and got the same exact performance results right. as Bloomberg GPT. So if that's the case, where's the moat, right? And there was this leaked memo from Google last summer saying, you know, we don't have a moat and neither does OpenAI. This is what they're referring to. Now, the OpenAI is, is posting a lot of sales gains, although uh, um, Altman is kind of admitted in the press the expenses associated with earning those revenues, he said, are eye-wateringly high. I don't trust him anyway. Too too adorable. Uh, <laughs> he's never had any adversity in his life, that kid. Uh, I, I would say the interesting takeaway from what you were saying yeah. reminds me a lot of Microsoft versus Linux or the browser wars where, like, one day it was so important that Internet Explorer was bundled with Windows that it rose to the level of a Supreme Court case and then like a month later, there's Firefox, there's Chrome, there's Mozilla, nobody gives a shit. Like that happens really fast in tech and we forget about those cases. Right. I so, wrote about that in the note that I released this morning, which so, is that these open- That's what I'm referencing. Yeah. So is that is that something for investors to be concerned <sighs> with? So. That a lot, of, a lot of valuation is being built up on the premise that these companies have developed something really important when it turns out it might be very easy to knock off. And as you, if you get the same results, you don't care if it's a fake Louis Vuitton bag necessarily if everyone thinks it's real. There, there is a lot of real stuff going on. 
um, some of the biomedical stuff that's going that's taking place with generative AI and on supervised okay. models is completely transformational. But I think we have to be really vigilant as investors here every quarter to just really dig through the you know the cash flow income statements r and d spending etc of companies that are deriving a lot of their revenues from large language models because over the next 2 to 3 years we'll see you know what the real adoption rate profitability and throw weight of this Nvidia stuff is. uh gained 750 billion dollars in market cap since January 1st yeah largely on the back of the earnings reports from Microsoft Meta and Apple wait, of indicating this year? of this year yes <sighs> indicating their plans to capex the hell out of this AI opportunity. Yeah, most of those capex dollars, I guess, are going right to Nvidia. Yeah, one, uh, one of the other things that's got to—they haven't even here. reported yet, though. I know. One of the other things that has to happen here is if you start to project forward the energy demands associated with yeah. this kind of stuff, it becomes untenable. And PJM, which is the the ISO, the independent system operator for the mid Atlantic part of the country, recently just released their energy demand forecasts just from data centers and and AI, and, and it's going like this. Yeah. In, and uh, at a time when the country is decommissioning coal, natural gas, and nuclear, and, and building more wind and solar, which are intermittent, and now you're adding a lot of demand from data centers, I mean, you're asking for trouble. Here. We so, need that energy to mine ETH also. <laughs> it's very critical to so, the infrastructure but, of but the country. Just one last point on one of the things that's going to have to happen is right now all these prompt windows and things are quadratic. So when you ask questions, it's quadra it's quadratically complicated to solve them. So what's going on at Stanford and MIT and a lot of the labs is, is there a way to make some of these models work uh, on a linear instead of a quadratic basis? And it's called subquadratic scaling. For people that are really into this space, that's something you're going to be reading so about. You can do it on a laptop. You don't need to have a, a, a cloud data center. Yes, because it. the mo the models are going to be made to be less power consuming yeah. and less max, ma less mathematically complex because they're going to bring it down to a sub quadratic scaling. They're they're switching to proof of stake. We are at this amazing point in time where the S and P five hundred is pushing up against five thousand. Maybe we'll be there tomorrow. Maybe we won't. Right. Uh, three years ago, what year is it? Wait, you want to talk about the Armageddon? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's it's a guilty pleasure. <laughs> I Everybody love it. in life have it. Go this on. is terrible. This they, is a terrible thing I did. Let him go. Do they let him cook. This is a terrible thing I did. <laughs> right. Let's we're doing it. What are we talking about here, Michael? Well, what's what's amazing is that there's this human negativity bias, uh, and a lot of social scientists have written about it. And in Europe, they did a couple of experiments where if if a newspaper only publishes positive news, uh, their their newsstand sales drop by two thirds. <laughs> People aren't interested. So, and so we know that there's kind of this human negativity bias, and and. The finan most of the financial media, whatever you want to call them, are, will always search out people that will say that, you know, disaster is around the corner. And irrespective of the progeny, track record, uh, or success rate of any of the people they're talking to, it almost, it's, it almost seems at times unvetted. As long as somebody has heard of the guy, there he goes. And so we, in 2019, we looked back and we took the most armageddon -y comments that we could find. Uh, you know, it's going to be the worst depression in my lifetime. There's, you know, it's going to be a disaster, uh, a repeat of the 1930s, et cetera, et cetera. House you have, of cards. You have like 10 of those. Right. Mike, Michael and I could have supplied you with hundreds. We This is, this is our right. hobby also. Right. So what we did was at, at the date of those comments, we said, okay, let's assume that you got up that morning and you were unfortunate enough to listen to this on, on CNBC, for example. And now, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell my stocks and I'm going to put money into some combination of cash and bonds. And so by the end of 2019, how much money would you have lost doing that? And the answer was somewhere between 30 and 60%. Then COVID hits. The funny part is it looks like these guys got temporarily bailed out by a global pandemic yeah. that they had no idea was coming. Yes. But after the COVID decline hit and after stocks were already down 20, 30 percent, they all doubled down. Of course. And so the red, get worse. the red dots on the right chart 
are when they doubled down and said, nah, you know, nah, this is really it. This is the end of humanity. This, you know, no more human life on the planet. And so we, and in the piece, we kind of show each one of the quotes of what it was. And of course, the markets have doubled since. They're, they're the financial whack pack. <laughs> but you know what's funny? Can I, can I, can I say? It's, it's very unkind of me to do this. <laughs> so, I got I to tell you, though, if you look at this list, and I'm not going to read the names, this reads like a podcast's wish list of guests. And the reason why is if you put one of these f-ing guys on the show, everyone's going to listen. Yeah. Everyone. And I think th- I write about hu- this. You're right. It's human nature. I write about this less about them. That's right. It's more a reflection about us. That's right. And and what, what it, we're responding to. And, you know, similarly, there was a study that was done at the University of Indiana um, in what year was that, uh, that tweet? 2016. In 2016, um, somebody did something that said 3 million illegal immigrants voted in the 2016 election. The bots immediately started to punt it around. Trump, we, you know, re- mentions it. Of course. And then it went completely viral, um, you know, in a matter of moments. And because people tend to kind of respond to stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and, whether, and, and whether or not the information is accurate. Well, first of all, we're genetically programmed to respond to that. We have we there there were humans a hundred thousand years ago who the alarm went off that the barbarians are coming through the gates. They didn't respond. Well, they were killed. They didn't pass their genes on. We here in this room and everyone on Earth today are the descendants of people whose ancestors responded to the alarm. That's what we do genetically. That's not so. We are already predisposed to pay close attention. And click the link and watch the show right. where the guy is yelling fire. Yeah, it's not It's not that the news is supplying it for no reason. We demand it. Right. That's, that's right. <laughs> and that's why I said it's less of a reflection about that. I've, I've come across a different phenomenon that I'm curious what your thoughts are. Uh, LinkedIn, interestingly, these are all people there ostensibly to build their careers. They get so angry at anything positive about the economy it's almost as if you you made fun of their mothers. If you say GDP, uh, Atlanta uh, GDP now forecast is higher and look at this great jobs report, nobody is in your comments like, yeah, cool. Yeah. People are furious. S- somebody emailed. Uh, I don't understand Somebody this at emailed all. me saying two years ago, you guys were so much more balanced. It's like <laughs> two years. Think about where the market and the economy was two years ago. It's not us. We're talking about the news. We're talking right. about the economy and the markets. I, I will say this for LinkedIn. Um, when I started using it, it was terrible. Like my feed was full of people posting motivational cat pictures and, you know, raising money for the the runs they were doing for the neighborhood library. And it was, it really wasn't helpful to me at all as an investor. It's gotten good lately. It's, it's, I don't know how, but my feed is consistently really good now. Economics, energy. It's the hottest social network in the world. Is there a billion right users? It works. A billion? We were just yes. talking about this. Microsoft is still reporting user growth there. What Nobody's paying attention to it. It is cr- – first of all, it is crushing Twitter What is for, uh, for financial content. LinkedIn. Yeah. It really works for me. Yeah. Now, is some of the commentary kind of off base? Yeah, but I've also met some fascinating people. I'm going to Same. Toronto on Tuesday to meet someone I met on LinkedIn to talk – Is it Drake? <laughs> Careful. Okay. Because um, it might be. Oh, God. Uh, oh, boy. So <laughs> – I'm going to Toronto next Tuesday to meet someone okay. to talk about this, uh, the viability of a technology to essentially draw CO2 from the atmosphere using direct or carbon capture. It's definitely Drake. Hold on. Totally <laughs> Combined <laughs> with hydrogen via green electrolysis to make synthetic jet fuel. And he and I both think it's bogus, but we're going to go through the, you know, the math, like the physics and the chemical chem- math on that because – there are certain things like military use of jet fuel that right now have no decarbonization options. And like, that's, that's the one that people put out there. I'm tempted to think it's not viable. So does he, but we're going to work through it. And I met that guy on LinkedIn. I was going to say, where else could that really, it could have happened on Twitter, but these days it's more likely that an interaction like that happens on LinkedIn. Right. So I've met some very interesting people on LinkedIn and there's some good stuff there in terms of like the, the fact that people can't, grasp complexity in, anymore. I don't think there's a better topic to talk about that than, than COVID. So could, do you want to spend a couple of minutes Let's on that? hundred percent. Okay. So 
I've got this pile of thoughts in my head about COVID. So on the one hand, on the, the people that are angry, upset, skeptical, and suspicious, you have every right to be. Yeah. The lockdowns took 50 million children out of school. It's going to be the worst educational disaster in the history of the United States. People are already now forecasting depressed lifetime earnings and, uh, you know, alcoholism, loneliness, uh, um, domestic abuse. The, the lockdowns, in retrospect, were a disaster. The school closings in particular, those, those children cohorts, a lot of them we are- lived, We lived through it with ours. Right. And yeah. the, the um, absenteeism rates in a lot of the parts of the country are, have doubled and haven't gone back down. Mm. So COVID shifted the absenteeism rates in a lot of places. The, and there was this movie in the 1970s. Do you remember Logan's Run? Yes. So Logan's Run is the opposite. Logan's Run is, a movie, is this movie where resources are scarce. And as soon as you're 30, they kill you. That's right. Because they do everything to preserve resources for the younger generation at the expense of the older one. COVID was the anti-Logan's run. Everything mm. was done to preserve the oldest generation we all at sacrificed. the expense of yeah. the youngest ones. No value judgment, but that's what was done. When the schools were closed, the, uh, the hospitalization rates for school-aged children was one half a person per 100,000. So the schools were closed, and that's what the hospitalization rate was. Uh, and I, I, I don't think the right cost-benefit lens was used in a lot of those lockdown uh, decisions. Well, well, hold on. Let me, let but me they thought going. you'd have immunity. Oh, if, excuse me. They thought they would kill it off. They didn't think that it would take place for six months, did they? I don't know what they knew, okay. But in uh, in retrospect, yeah, of course, the the, the educational impact of those last was disaster. Number two, in terms of you know, how do you feel about the drug companies? A lot of big drugs have either been recalled or given a black box warning. And you know, I wrote a piece recently that that showed a long list of drugs where the FDA initially said, "Hey, this is fine," and then it changed. And you know, my son took Singular for years. And then after which it, you know, it got a black box warning because of potential mental health side effects. So, you know, that's frustrating. Uh, even put aside Purdue Pharma, um, some of the biggest drug companies have paid billions of dollars in fines for off-label marketing, which basically means pushing their drugs to be used for conditions that they weren't suited for. So there's a lot of things to be frustrated about. Um, some of the, uh, and then, but on the other hand, Vaccine presentable dis preventable diseases are generally down like 98 to 99 percent over the last 40 years. And, you know, th those it used to be kind of a very scary world when those before those vaccines existed. And the problem with Twitter is you're only going to get one side of the picture, either one of those sides. And you're not going to get it. Just, it's so hard to find a nuanced view. And. You know, vac the vaccines in general, vaccinations has been one of the biggest, other than antibiotics, has been one of the biggest public health successes in the history of humanity. So you can simultaneously be angry about the lockdowns, frustrated with the drug companies, um, supportive of, of government efforts to fine them for their misdeeds, but also appreciate the benefits of vaccination. But nobody is that. Everybody is, I'm team A or I'm team B. And that's On team A, Wear your mask still in 2024. And right. you, seriously, though, this is what it's turned into. Wear your mask, vote Biden, uh, use my pronouns, and how dare you call into question the vaccines. Right. Team B is, you know, right. F your feelings and right. know Here, that now okay. they're pro-measles. Yeah. The, well, everyone's the, crazy. Yeah. I agree with you. Everyone's crazy. The, the Children's Health Defense, which is the RFK thing, uh, they published a book. Uh, a little over a year and a half ago. And it had a picture of a boy who had collapsed at football practice and died on the cover. And, uh, you know, the, the, it, they, they expressly said, you know, here's, here's one of the byproducts of, of this COVID vaccine. Um, they never reached out to the family to discuss using the photo. Uh, he died of something completely different mm. and had never been vaccinated against COVID. Are these the, you can have all the questions you want. Right? Are these the people that you trust? If that's if that's how they do the cover of the book, 
do you trust what's inside the if they're are on these your, the people you trust if they're on your team you trust them right well, well that's this, the problem this is, is that the problem is that the yeah. is that we've lost the ability to kind of have a nuanced picture and say life is complicated and a lot of these things can be true at the same time so I don't want to move off if you're not done but I want to talk about another complicated Please issue do. okay US debt this is a big one. This is this yeah. has been with us as long as time. Yeah. It it doesn't go away because the numbers keep growing. What are your overall thoughts on US state sustainability? Say, you started at JP Morgan in 1987. You must remember the deficit billboard where <laughs> yeah. it was scrolling numbers and they would go yeah. 24 hours a day. You would it would well, say your share of the deficit that? is So I think the debt clock still exists. It's still there. I, so let me let okay. me let me let me quote you and then you could yeah. you could riff. You wrote, by the early 2030s, the CBO projects that all federal government revenues will be consumed by entitlement payments and interest on the federal debt. Sometime before this happens, I expect a combination of market pressure and rating agency downgrades, which have already begun, to force the U.S. to make substantial changes to taxes and entitlement. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How? What? <laughs> Where? <laughs> well, here's how. So let's, let's do part A and part B. Part A, let's do the first part of what you said. Because it went by fast. What in, in the 2030s, early 2030s, all of federal government tax revenue is going to be needed to pay entitlements and interest on the debt. In other words, there's no money left for the judiciary, defense, non-defense, discretionary spending, Pell grants, like you name it. There's so which entitlement gets whacked? What ha what's, what's going to have to happen, what I think will happen, is somewhere, whether it's 2028, 2029, the rating agencies will say, look, we we're going to give you a year to the Congress. We're going to give you a year. And if you do nothing, we're going to downgrade you to single A. And, and you know what happens when they downgrade us to single A? The price of the, tre the treasury bond goes up in value. <laughs> that, that's what happened last time. But you, you do reach a point where collateral posting becomes an issue. And, you know, I, I think there is a point where th the impact of that downgrade will then catalyze market actions. We owe the money to ourselves. Not entirely. There's, there's, you know, the Chinese own They've a little over selling. a trillion and they, they still own a lot. Okay. They own more than people think because they own some of it through Belgium custodians they don't disclose. What would they do if they sold treasuries? Like seriously, what would they do? What would they buy? They need something because this is involved with trade. If, this is, right. this is trade related FX. Yes, they need, and they need, they need, well, they may, by the time this rolls along, they may need not they may not need to okay. defend the RNB as much as they need to do that today. Okay. But I mean, the, look, I've been in the camp that it has been a mistake for investors to change their portfo investment portfolios because of debt issues and geopolitics, right? Which we can talk about. The too. biggest distraction to investing. Yeah. Worse geopolitics number one, debt number two. But you will, by mathematically, you will reach a point where even if it's not affecting the markets directly, um, the two countries with the worst growth and productivity rates over the last 50 years, Italy and Japan. Right. So you didn't have a debt crisis, but eventually the debt started to crowd out all other kinds of private sector activity. So that's my fear. We either have some kind of a debt crisis or you get this kind of malaise where growth settles in at only one and a half percent because the magnitude of the debt financing is just crowding out. Your Armageddonist, other. though, will go much further than you just did on what the um, what the negative effect of this is going to be. And they'll act as though it's much more urgent. Yeah, by, I, I by believe gold, if you if we lose our reserve currency status, is gold not the solution? Well, yeah, what's the portfolio answer? I mean, that's that what scenario? they would say. Right. I would say, look, anybody that can afford to buy gold should own some, right? So in other words, if you have enough money, certainly if you have enough money that's going to outlive you, um, you should you should own some amount of gold. Well, let me and by the way, you should own why? it. If you really believe that, you should own unallocated gold. So let me ask you why. Why Instead should you own gold? If, if the dollar, what, what would gold do in the event of a and, and dollar? What's, and what's unallocated gold? There's two ways to own gold. One is you go to a bank and say, give me a structured note linked to the price of gold. But in that case, you're a creditor. You, you know, you also have creditors. Yeah, that's no bank. good. That won't solve this. Right. So that play, you, then you want unallocated gold, which is you actually are owning something. Backyard gold. Is directly linked to a specific, you know, amount of gold held in custody somewhere with your name on it. Barry, That's unallocated. Barry Ritholtz and I went to this guy's office. It's a true story. In 2010, 
and he was in the 50s, really nice guy. And he was selling an investment product. You know, Barry would get all these calls from, Barry wrote B Bailout Nation, so he would like hear from every crank. And so we went up there and the guy was pitching to high net worth investors. It's a vault. We hold your gold, but it's in Switzerland. So if if the shit goes down in the United States, you have to go. You yeah. but and you you have to just make sure you have a way to get to Switzerland, right? And your gold will be waiting for you. And the guy was like oversubscribed, meaning he had already allocated all the room in this vault that there was. Now, yeah. I doubt he's still in business today. If you go back, one of the, so one of the benefits of being part of J.P. Morgan, we can look back in the archives, and yeah. if we look back at how moderately and very wealthy family portfolios looked in the 20s and 30s. They had 20 to 30% in gold. Yep. It was the financialization- Until it was confiscated. Of the, of the, of the, the post-Volcker rate decline. That financialization is what drove gold, you know, to the de minimis levels in a lot of portfolios that it is today. But, you know, kind of from the 20s to the 70s, wealthy families owned a lot of it. So talk about financialization and dollar status. Okay. What about what about Bitcoin? Uh, like on, on ironically. I don't want to go there yet. Okay. I don't want to go there yet. I want to save <laughs> like, that for some years. Okay. Two years. So can we? Uh, but but in terms of, I I I don't believe. I believe that's a crossover point, where the government has no money left to do to do anything except pay interest on the debt and entitlements. I I don't think that is a viable form of government. So what would and a will solution create be? problems? That, that the three of us can't anticipate right now. So what is a reasonable solution? Lower interest rates, monetize the debt. The Fed, the, the, that, that's the Fed the, expands its that's balance the, sheet. That's the answer. That's the, well, that's, that's, the, that's unfor been the answer. Unfor unfortunately. That's, that's one approach. That's an answer. That's right. an answer. The other answer involves a bunch of compromises. Nope. That no, we're are, not do that. I, I, I think you're <laughs> underestimating <laughs> The shock, the the shock to the system in terms of growth and productivity. Do shocks to the system typically lead to more or less uh, cooperation, part, uh, the, bipartisan what, cooperation? In the history of the United, let's look. Let's look the at wars. the tarp. Let's look at the tarp bill. Okay. The tarp bill, there, there. You know, it was the market riot. First attempt at the tarp bill fails. I watched it. Market from a riot bar. again. I know. Then the tarp bill passes. So if yeah. there's some kind of market riot at some point linked to this, and I'm not just, and I, I think there could be. Yeah. That's what will give politicians the out to say we have to do some of this now. I think a lot of the compromises are going to come on the back of the wealthy. So can I at least tick through some of them? I know you don't believe this will happen. No. But can I, I at least say what they I would, would love be? to hear. So, I just, <laughs> my question is what politician puts the gun to their head and pulls the trigger? No, they'll be forced to. You're not listening. They don't want to do it. This is when they get their backs are against the wall like tarp. There was an, a 900-point Dow sell-off, and this is when the Dow was at 9,000. And so they're going to go they after— were, They were gonna, circuit breakers. So they, they went back. They're going to go after their biggest donors? I, I, it's I a think tax you're, hike you and an entitlement be, cut all at once. Everyone, yeah. everyone hates it, and everyone loves it. <laughs> okay. At my income level, I not, still not get— brag. No, but I'm just saying at a, at, a, at a at a high net worth income level, I still get to make tax exempt contributions to 401k. Yeah, I, you know may, maybe I shouldn't be able yeah, to do that. I could see that. Um, I st um, at some point maybe my Medicare gets means tested, right? Yeah. Because I I know I've paid into the Medicare system and I deserve to get paid out, but if dollars are scarce, maybe that's got to be means tested. Um, there's, there's a lot of, in, of tax entitlements in the system. The mortgage one has been reduced, right? From 1.1 million to 750. Um, but you know, maybe that gets cut to 500, right? Yeah, What's the price the, of meeding home in the United deduct, States? They cut Does the it need a 700? Yeah. So, so they do stuff like I, I, that. There's, and then there's the big one, which, which Democrats have been pushing for a long time. And you know, this can drive people nuts. The social security system is a savings plan. You pay in, you get out. Yeah. And there's a cap on the taxation, on the payroll tax, there's a cap on income on which they collect social security taxes in the neighborhood of $125,000. Um, Obama was, was proposing for years this thing called a donut hole, which is from 125 to 250,000, no tax. From 250 up, you start paying the payroll tax again. But your social security benefits do not rise commensurately with that increased payroll tax. Okay. Now, social security is not a savings plan. It's another entitlement plan. It's a radical change, but like that's one of the grab bags that is that could happen here. So think, I I think that think, some of this is, I don't I 
I think some of this will have to happen. Thinking Not out loud, the donor class could live with that more so than they could live with uh, just a a higher bracket, like a like a higher right. Like they would prefer something like that because. They're not funding their retirements with their income or their social security. None of that shit really matters. What really matters is investment related tax uh, here in New York. Right. Well, carry like the, these the are other the one on the list. The other one on the list is a five to seven percent federal tax on on municipal bonds for people with adjusted gross income above a certain level. What about ten thirty five exchanges? That is like arguably the I know, most. Yeah. I mean, it's so or, much, or, or or you know, or capital gains treatment, capital for, gains tax treatment for in private equity, but. Those numbers are too small. They, so like the they ones I the list okay. are the ones that that have material amounts of dollars associated with them when the CBO does this analysis of what are the things that could change. What us. do the Democrats uh, give up in that scenario? So that's one side of the compromise. What right. does the other side look like? <sighs> Higher co-pays for Medicare, right? Okay. So um, a res- and probably a restriction – in treatments, and we're seeing a little preview of it. In a lot of states and cities, there's unfunded pensions. Can't do anything about those. But there's also this thing called OPEB. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's for other post employment no. benefits. Basically, we're in retirement health care. Okay. If you, if you roll back the clock five to seven years, a lot of states and cities had massive projected unfunded retiree health care obligations to government employees. Those numbers have come down a lot. And the way that those have come down is higher co-pays, less coverage of certain conditions, and, and other adjustments to the plan that make them less valuable. And so that's that's probably a big part of this. And remember, a lot of the entitlement system that was built in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, life expectancy has gone up 10 to 15 years since. Sure. Then. And so- some of the insolvency in all of this is simply a function of demographics, and the country's going to have to make some difficult choices. So I, I was the last thing on this, yeah. and then we'll move on. But sure. I was, I was going to say, you have people in their 70s now living the way their parents lived in their 50s, spending a lot more money than prior generations had. So arguably, yes, it might be straining the, the healthcare system to keep these people alive longer. However, they are continuing to be a productive part of the economy – they may not be working, but they are definitely living. And it's – I'm not saying one is like uh, – I'm not saying it's a 100 percent financial trade off. I'm just saying it's like a quality of life trade off right. to have this last 30 years tacked on to the end of your life that nobody could have envisioned 100 years ago. Right. So. All right. So we've already kept you for an hour. We're, we'll do five minutes on China and then we have two more quick topics and then we'll let you go. I'm here. For okay. Long long. How cheap is China? So you wrote – China has, and this is music to my ears, I think. I, I just bought China. I just bought FXI. We'll see. China has become the ultimate value trap in recent years. In my experience, most value traps eventually come to an end. What do you mean by that? Come to an end sounds yeah, ominous. Yeah, I'm not, am I, should, I, should I be excited or should I sell? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what I wrote in retrospect was, was, you know, kind of a fatuous thing to say. Because as if value traps only have two ways of ending, either bankruptcy or in the case of countries, you, you become like Argentina, Pakistan, or Zimbabwe, and you get ejected from the emerging market index and put it to some bucket called the frontier index, which means nobody wants to invest in you. Um, you know, for example, Pakistan, Russia, places like that trade at a 3PE. What it's meant to say is if, you, if that's not what's going to happen in China – at some point, selling will be exhausted and there, there'll be some kind of a bottoming for me. So I just feel like we've reached such a crescendo of China is uninvestable. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, well, the, they threw, the, out, they threw been, out the head of securities regulation. They did. So that's, the what, last that's two, the bottom. And, well, the last two times they did that, the markets rallied a lot. Yeah. But that was 2016, 2018, the market's worse. I, I, I think the risk return proposition for investing in China now is is prop is better than it's been in a long time because like you said everybody hates it everybody's convinced it's going nowhere but please don't use any leverage sure, of course, you need to be course, prepared to lose another thirty percent before do they it goes care up. that foreigners no longer are interested in investing in Chinese equities I doubt it they don't seem to care I don't think so okay so then they but they want a homegrown constituency of investors for right. some reason but do they really want that I I think they want it but they're, they're 
China doesn't have the kind of regulatory capture you have in the United States. Like when when equities are crashing here, you know, the, the, there's a lot of linkages between the private sector and the government that are going to put pressure on the Congress to to do something to stop it. Um, you know, and you all, by the way, you also have a lot of equities, not just in defined contribution plans, but in defined benefit plans. And so the, the system is designed to do something to help the equity market. And it was no secret in the wake of 2009 that the people at the Fed got up every day and looked at the stock market, yeah, not the credit market. They were looking at the stock market to yeah. see whether or not that That was China working. consumer confidence, that's some hell of a chart. Oh my God. It just, it just absolutely fell off a cliff. Right. Is, is it, is it possible, and maybe I'm being too cute here, but is it possible that China is- is not that it's uninvestable, but it's only catastrophic. And the difference between that is enough to have a, to lead to a global rally. If it's merely catastrophic and not uninvestable. I don't think it's that connected to global markets. So let me just say, give you a couple of thoughts on how we're looking at this. First of all, a 10 PE is cheap for China. There's a lot of markets trading at a 10 PE, Turkey, Brazil, Israel, Greece, Austria, S and P banks, we have a chart in today's eye on the market that you you want something below a 10 PE, you, you have, don't have a, to go there. You, you got a lot of places to go. Secondly, um, you know, in China, they, I would get a lot, anything could bounce 10 or 15%, right? And firing securities like related, strong arming domestic investors into the market, jailing short sellers, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's not going to work for long. Uh, make, make, tell the brokerages from now on, no, Buys only. No sell button. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> take up, take the, the sell button out. I, here's what would make me really bullish. In 2008, if you remember this, before the TARP came along, there was a plan floated that they were going to buy the bad loans of the banks, you know, and do a bad bank scheme. Market didn't like it. And I found this piece from the uh, um, IMF showing that historically, when governments buy bad loans, GDP and equities kind of don't do much. Mm. But when they buy bank debts and recapitalize the banks, the equity goes up a lot and the GDP went up, goes up much more quickly. So when the TARP got announced on October, I looked at the archives this, you know, yesterday, on October 14th, 2008, I had a piece saying, we're bullish. Because the historical track record is when the government recapitalizes the banking system, they're addressing the core issues. You were five months early. Concern. You were still five months early. <laughs> well, but but it was it was a sign. I know less stocks were going down, even though we made right. an ultimate right. Lower if low. you right. if if you had the ability to do, to kind of wade through March two thousand nine, you did fine by in retrospect by buying in in, yes. in October. So I think you're punting in China, but I would argue that you could be holding and not just a punt, if we actually got a policy in China that was going to recapitalize the banks that hold all this bad real estate. They're not going to have civil unrest there over this, though. They, they don't have the what same pressure. The, you, the no, people over stocks, are, over stocks. No, I know. The peop, in China, the people that are upset about what's happening, the only place that's safe for them to post about it is on the U.S. Embassy website. That's, that's right. There's no other venue where they can safely do that anymore because that's of right. the pervasiveness of how people are following. That's right. So, th so this can be like a tempest in a teapot in China. It's not directly affecting Anyone really? That's right. That's uh, right. I, I think it is. I think you're, you know, it's an interesting thing in and of itself, by itself, that has limited contagion impacts anywhere else. And but they it's don't interesting to look and at. They don't take any pride in like their companies being these juggernauts, uh, the technology companies. They see them as threats, uh, the government. They see them more as threats than as signs that their economy is prosperous. It's weird because I would have yeah. always guessed that well, they would go the other way with that. Put it this way. Um, the risk return of being a Chinese CEO yeah. is- Go to Singapore. <laughs> you yeah. want to be a Chinese CEO, be I mean, a, the an last expat. Two, they, one of the trust banks that failed last year, the CEOs are missing. Yeah. Right. They, they may be hanging out with all those Russian guys that keeps falling Michael's, out of Michael's windows. listening to uh, uh, Chinese e-commerce company <laughs> conference calls right now. <laughs> He's listening for for the CEO's voice to see how confident they are. So Mark, Mark is I, still there. I, yeah, yeah. I'd be curious to <laughs> yes. hear your take on what. So these GLP one drugs have had just a miraculous run. Yeah, Eli Lilly is up one hundred and sixteen percent over yeah. the last year alone. It's the so, eighth largest company in America now. Really, and no AI. Do you think that maybe 
the, so you could say that that's that's reasonable. It's warranted given everything that it's doing. Do you think the other side of it, like the selling of of alcohol and soda and chips, is that part of it overdone? What's your take on that? There was there, that was a knee jerk reaction over the summer, and then I think people started doing the math. And it's another example of two things being possibly true at the same time. Is there a huge opportunity, market opportunity for Lilly and some of the other companies? Yes. Is the aggregate impact of that on insulin manufacturers and, and producers of, you know, of crappy food large enough to dent their margins? That's less clear. I mean, look what happened to the insulin pumps. Do you know? Yeah. Do you, do but you know? look, again, look what happened to them. Right. In the fourth quarter. So the market said maybe we got ahead of ourselves. Yeah. And I think there's still a lot of digestion of, of information. To me, here's the big question about weight loss drugs is they – you're going to lose 15 to 18% of your body weight if you take them on average. Um, if you stop taking them, you're going to gain most of the weight back and all of the other benefits you had are going to go back to the baseline. So you have to take it forever, right? For now. For now. For now. In its current form. In its current form. Yeah. Um, and with a needle. Yes. And there, there's a lot of companies obviously working on pill form. Part of the issue is the pill form has to last longer. You have to use more of the active ingredients so the side effects are more intense. So mm -hmm. that's part of what they're still working through. Um, the, the real question is if it's just weight loss, a lot of companies are going to – struggle to cover that and medicare is not allowed to cover that right they they right now there's a there's legis there's there's it's not on the books that medicare can cover that so the what the whole industry is banking on is how effective are these drugs at reducing other comorbidities heart attacks and can That's the they, number one can they thing. get these drugs rebranded as cardiovascular drugs right so in a classic wall street moment last year there was this big Wagovi semaglutide study. And after 30 or 36 months, um, there were two reports that came out on the same day. One of them was from Wall Street. 20% decline in, in cardiovascular risk, you know, <laughs> from these drugs. And a guy that I read a lot named Eric Topol at Scripps, which is the Biomedical Institute of California, was like, I think the title was meh, M-E-H. One and a half percent decline. Both numbers were right. The end point after 36 months in the placebo group, 8% of the people had cardiovascular events. The Wagovi patients, 6.5% of them had uh, cardiovascular events. Wall Street said that's a 20% decline. 1.5 divided by 8 is 20. <laughs> okay. The medical community was like, eh, you know, three years of injections and 1.5% decline in cardiovascular risk, meh. Right. And so that's the battlefield now is can they, the FDA and the CBO be convinced that that number, whether it's one and a half or 20, is, is big enough to justify rebranding these drugs for osteo, you know, osteoporosis, uh, uh, sleep apnea, os knee osteoarthritis, um, uh, heart failure. Um, cardiovascular events and things like that. That's I'll the big 20% yeah, number is such bullshit. And of course, of course, Wall Street did it. When the 10-year goes from 4% down to 3.5%, that's not a whatever percent drop. It's a 50 basis point drop. It's 0.5%. It's not a percent of a percent. Uh, you, lose a, you, you, you lose muscle with the fat. And when you're over 50 years old, it's really dangerous to lose muscle mass. This is one of the things that, like, we won't know for a really long time. But when you read, when you read scientists or medical people talk about this subject, they're like this is not a this is not an asterisk, like losing muscle mass. If you think you're getting rid of all these comorbidities because somebody is down weight, think of all the comorbidities you're now adding, like, right? Because like, you have frail like a lot adults. of other drugs. Right. These drugs were developed for people with extremely risky pound conditions. People. Yes, where the 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 downstream risks were vastly outweighed by the benefits. Yes, to have mostly healthy people taking these in perpetuity to kind of keep their weight down, I think has unexplored medical consequences. I refuse to. I'm actually eating more uh, to show my solidarity. You're going to offset those. That's right. Yeah, you're going to offset the Slim Jims. I'm going to have all the morbidities. So, Michael, in yes. honor of the late, great Byron Ween, yeah. who did his top 10 surprises, how long did he do it for? Decad Forever. Yeah. I don't remember not reading them. Put it this way. One of his surprises— the union wins the Civil War. <laughs> Josh. Nailed it.
<laughs> so, all right, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to read through your if top you, if 10. If you delete that, I resign and from the podcast. I just want to, we'll, we'll, we'll stay on the spiciest one. All right, we'll go through this go quickly ahead. and then we'll circle back to the spiciest one. Top 10 surprises of Michael Sembolis. The US dollar remains stable. The DOJ FTC wins a big antitrust case. I'm going to skip the spicy one. We'll return to that. The driverless car backlash is coming. Broadly syndicated loan losses rise above private credit losses for the first time. Argentine dollarization will fail if implemented. Russian invasion of Ukraine drags on with no ceasefire in 2024. Despite storm clouds over U.S. regional banks, their stocks will do well in 2024 with stable or rising price to book values. Due to retirement of dispatchable power generation and underinvestment in pipelines, gas storage, and winterization, major U.S. cities will face electricity outages and or natural gas outages. Researchers will complete work on inhaled COVID vaccine that will sharply reduce transmission. And the one that I skipped, the one that we're going to talk about briefly, President Biden withdraws sometime between Super Tuesday and the November election, citing health reasons. If this happens, you will be world famous forever. These, you know, Byron did these forever. Did, I think, was my mic cut or am I still on? <laughs> Byron wrote these forever. I never read any of the articles that kept score. Because the purpose of this exercise is to think about the things that could happen and how you prepare for them, what the downstream impacts are. I am not predicting Biden's going to drop out. I want, But I think it's a possibility. Both he and Trump are older than male life expectancy. And the two of them combined are the second oldest pair of people ever to run for president adjusted for life expectancy. So in 1848, two guys ran in their 60s which was around the same as today because people only lived to 50 then. So, but they're the second oldest pair of people ever to run for president. So thinking that one of them could drop out at this point is, is not the demographic leap that you might think it is. So that's, that's point number one. Point number two, um, when you run for president, presumably your supporters and advisors and your family aren't just evaluating your current condition but are you fit to handle the responsibilities of being the commander in chief for the next four years? You know, when, and I think when you look at Biden, uh, you know, I'm not the first person to ask this question. David Axelrod in the Democratic Party was one of the first people to ask these questions out loud. So I wanted to kind of understand what the, what the process would be and what the implications would be if Biden were to drop out. And so that was the purpose of having this discussion, starting this analysis. And I wrote about the no labels movement today, which we should talk about for, for two minutes. Please, what Go is ahead. that? What is the no labels movement? So the no labels movement is a bunch of people that have gotten together. Uh, they're already on the ballot in 13 states, and they're trying to get ballot access in 15 more states. On the blockchain? No, the actual I'm not going. <laughs> I'm not going there. So this kid has like fucking Bitcoin Tourette's. Right. Nobody wants to hear about Bitcoin on the planet he's, right now. He's, well, yeah. You know the bankless guys? Call them. They'll have you as a guest on the show. You can do that right. for 45 minutes with them. Right. We're, By the way, the Australian Stock Exchange like spent 250 or $300 million to try to convert their back office systems to blockchain. <laughs> yeah. The whole thing sure ended up as a fiat. disaster. Sure and they a fired fiasco. everybody involved. Did it go as well as El Salvador or better? <laughs> about the same. Yeah, okay. So- no the No Labels movement yeah. says, look, even though these two candidates are winning the primaries, in the general electorate, they're both deeply unpopular. We're going to run a unity ticket. And, may, you know, I'm throwing out names, right? But let's say Manchin and John Kasich, right? Let's say there's a Manchin-Kasich ticket. They're going to run as a No Labels movement in the, in the general election. They're, they're not going to have any kind of a primary because they're just going to create this party. They'll get ballot access and they're on the general election in November. Um, the last time an uh, independent uh, candidate won electoral votes and not just some votes was 1968. It was George Wallace, 68, right? He won some states, didn't yeah, he? He did. Yeah. He did. That's wild. Sure did. Okay. So, well, that yeah, that's when the South was kind of- No, it was bad. You know, a lot of, there was a lot of political transition. Yeah. It's, it's when kind of the Southern Democrats had become extinct and it was becoming Republican and there was this interim period. So, uh, look, you're, I mean, Bill Clinton, Paul, 
Paul Simon, I mean, the guys that used to be Chuck Robb, members of the Democratic leadership, they're, they're now completely centrist. They were seen as being super progressive for their time. Things have shifted a lot. So let's assume that ma this mansion, made up mansion Kasich ticket wins five states and they win 25 presidential electors, okay? But because of that, Trump's a 262, Biden's a 250. Like nobody gets 270. Nobody gets to 270. Yeah. The no labels people are saying, don't worry, we'll kind of figure it out and form a unity government. So by the time the January 6th joint session rolls along, we'll, we'll have a unity government. Not so fast. The two thirds of the states in the United States have something called elector binding rules. So if they're, if that no labels ticket wins electors in a whole bunch of states, they can't switch. Okay. Uh, faithless, they can't be faithless electors. They cannot electors. be faithless electors. Okay. He's very well read. Yeah, what the hell? So, so that's a good pull, yeah. right? So that's a faithless elector, right? And there have to be rules against that because otherwise what would prevent any elector from yeah. saying, I was attached to this I'll candidate. Throw, I'll throw my votes I'm to just the gonna, other guy. Yeah, for money or a position yep. in the cabinet or stuff like that. So there are elector binding rules in most states that prevent this. And a lot of your audience probably knows right now, if nobody gets past 270, you end up well, with the election goes to the House. It's a 12th Amendment contingent oh, election. It's a, it's and every house. state delegation gets one vote. Okay. So that's messy. The other problem is, of course, a unity government sounds like deal making. Nobody it is. likes this this this. Well, not only that, that, there are federal and and state bribery laws right. that prevent you from trading political favors. What does that look like? Make, make my son-in-law the, the chief of staff and I'll give you these 10 electoral votes? No, it's a little less crude than that. It's okay. probably we are this we are this kind of moderate centrist ticket. We want we want this administration to support more, you know, transmission build out, oil and gas pipelines, you know, support for for this and that kind of policy and and then we'll, you know, move our can try to convince our electors to to support you instead. If you had to guess, does the person that votes no label assuming that they're on the ballot where 13 states so far, what's they're, the, most, they're, popular, they're what's the get... most popular state they're on the ballot for? I, I don't know. It's okay. Uh, I don't know. Is that person more left-leaning or more right-leaning? We don't know yet. It's oh, okay. very interesting because even if they don't win any electors- Who do they pull from? If they pull 4 to 5% yeah. of the vote, that could be enough in states like Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, um, and, and it's a, uh, so it's Nevada. A it's de facto, it's a spoiler. It's oh. a Ross Perot. They, I sent them eye on, their, eye on the market this morning. Yeah. An hour later- the head of the no labels movement contacted. Wow. I would I want to present my case to why we're not just in this as spoilers. We believe that we can win a majority of electors and you know, because everyone is so dissatisfied with the two candidates that are going to be running. We think we can win this election. Here's what they don't know, or maybe they know, but they they wish it weren't true. The majority of voters are single issue voters. I won't say which issue. Some are abortion, some are guns, right? But right. like generally speaking, most people, they have that one thing. And if you disagree with that one thing, there's no way you can co convince them that they're that this is a good candidate for any other right. reason. So no but labels doesn't be, work in that in that world. Right. But this it's gonna be interesting because Robert Kennedy is also polling and he's running it as an independent too. So did he draft Andrew Yang? Is that is that in progress? Did you I, hear that? That I haven't seen. Okay. That's what really I mean, put it put it this way. Uh, given how crazy this year has been, maybe it's Bo and Yang. From <laughs> SNL, right? I mean, like anything is possible. I saw Andrew Yang in an airport and he was signing autographs and uh, he, I guess he was waiting for a flight, but like he, yeah. he has, he has something. He, he, I don't, I'm not but saying he's Robert Kennedy. He Robert something. Kennedy is a charming guy. He's no younger than uh, Biden and Trump, but he actually presents older. Who? Robert he, Kennedy? Kennedy presents older than Biden when you hear him talk. Yes. I've seen him do shirtless push he's got, he's got He's got pecs. I know, but it, what? how old is he? You know, when- 75, he's when not I 78? Was, when I was six or seven years old and, and his father was assassinated. Yeah. Uh, I, I was like a weird kid. And I wrote a condolence letter, like in crayon to Ethel, uh, his wife. And I got a handwritten response. That's amazing. And 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 I don't I mean I think I I I choose to believe it was from Ethel. Could have been from anybody, right? But I choose to believe it was from Ethel and it hung on my wall until I went to college, you know. So that's your single issue vote. You're voting for Kennedy because no. of that letter. And so I I have this weird attachment to the guy where I want to believe him. 
some of the stuff he talks about on Ukraine is very interesting, you know, because he's kind of tied in with John Mearsheimer at the University of, of Chicago, who, who was kind of talking about, you know, NATO pushed its luck. And at the end of the 1990s, there were a lot of people that were kind of telling the Clinton administration, if you keep moving the NATO barrier closer and closer to Russia, there's going to be a price to pay. In a, you know, and, and a lot of that stuff turned out to be right. I don't so think, some of the stuff now, he loses me completely on the vaccine. That's stuff. what I was going to say. I don't, I don't know if he can get over that hump with independents who lean left. The vaccine, the taint right. of being a vaccine truther might be too tough for him you to know, pull there, votes from, he's from interesting. those people. There are some days when he poses it as questions. And I have a lot of the same questions. Yeah. My son has a peanut allergy. Why have peanut allergies like increased – by a factor of four or five over 30 years. What's going on in the food supply? There are legitimate questions to ask, but there really aren't any legitimate questions to ask about general vaccine safety. The numbers are very clear, and there's a lot of disingenuous science that, that's being floated by the Children's Health Defense to argue against that. So he loses me there, but I, I have a soft spot for I ask you an invest, in it from an investing standpoint on the election. Yeah. We, we're not getting questions from clients right now. I think clients are like politics out. Um, well, not just that. The last time we had a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate was when the Affordable Care Act was passed. Yeah, There's no way I could imagine a 60-vote filibuster-proof majority in the Senate for either party happening anytime so that's soon. Gonna, that's so you can't gonna ask get you. the kind of transformational policies that would radically change. So my, my, that's my answer to anyone that would say, like, is this a risk for the market? Yeah, of course it is. Everything's a risk for the market. But – no. This is two lame duck presidents running against each other. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the, the degree of freedom around what actual policies are going to result from this or uh, from investors are marginal. Go ahead. Jake Sherman just tweeted, the special counsel report says that, uh, let me just read this. In his interview with our office, Mr. Biden's memory was worse. He did not remember when he was vice president, forgetting on the first day of the interview when his term ended, if it was 2013, when did I stop being vice president, is a quote, and forgetting on the second day of the interview when his term began. He did not remember, even within several years, when his son Bo died. Uh, Where is this coming from? This is a special counsel. This is an interview. Uh, uh, this is from Teen Vogue. Like this is this is uh, and this this is uh, this is what we're dealing with. Two very elderly men. And it's not ageist. It's not ageist to point out that we know empirically cognitive abilities decline. Look, over one of time. the reasons that I keep working, I'm 61. When I've seen personally that when you yeah. know when people retire in their 60s and kind of do nothing, their cognitive skills, mental recall, all sorts of stuff declines. Right. And like most men in my age, the last thing my wife wants me to do is, is to be around the house. See, Michael doesn't believe me. I tell him I'm I I, I tell him when I hit my number, I'm gone. I'm, <laughs> I don't care about my cognitive abilities. I'm gonna disappear into the wind. He's, I, I think he there are, no I way. think there are some really important discussions that 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 have to take place with the president and his family yeah. in terms of whether or not he can handle the rigors, not just of the campaign, but of the election that follows. And this is stressful for a 50 year old man. Re remember, yeah. remember how public opinion changed on Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? She was idolized her entire life. She made a choice at the end. And some of the people in her own party kind of look at her differently now because they see that choice as having been made. Meaning the right at the reason. end of Obama's term, she could have raised her hand and said, replace me. Yes. And she didn't. Right. It might not have mattered. Obama tried to replace a different uh, and uh, Merrick justice. Garland, yeah. And, and they said yeah. no. All and he I'm, said, oh, OK. All I'm saying is that if, if Biden runs and doesn't win, you yeah. can imagine an enormous amount of recrimination based, based on whatever the exit polling might be about you know why why didn't he give somebody else a chance? So let me let's just wrap it up. I, I don't I don't know whether he's going to drop out or not. I have absolutely no idea. You know who would win this matchup? It's really early. Anything could happen. But in terms of the rules and how the rules work, up and up until and through the convention, the DN if if Biden were to withdraw, the DNC would be able to say you know at the convention here are the new rules. Any delegates that have been won are unbound. So Marianne Williamson, Dean Phillips, sorry, but if you want any delegates, they don't count. They're all being unbound and freed up and can be voted at the convention for people that meet the following characteristics. For example, you have to have been a sitting senator or governor. So that's how they would narrow it down. After the oh, convention- so you don't get crazy candidates from all over the they place. They would establish the rules right, about who those delegates could vote for. Okay. 
after the convention, it becomes a papal puff of smoke. So after the convention this summer, if Biden were to drop out for health reasons, the DNC would meet in a room and make a decision that if Biden drops out, he's now being replaced by Dwayne Gavin Johnson no. or Murphy or Pritzker or whomever. Yeah. And, and, and that's how, so the process changes pretty substantially once you get past the convention. It's going to have to be somebody that can raise money really quickly. Like a, like a, I hate, you know, Gavin Newsom, somebody that's just like, I don't want to do this. I said, I wasn't going to do it, but for the good of the party and the country, I have to do it. And somebody that can immediately start raising money. And that narrows the list down even smaller. I agree. So that's anything right. else on the list. <laughs> on board. RFK Jr. 70, by the way, he's 70. All right. So, yeah, man. So <laughs> he's a spring chicken. Um, did you have fun today on the show? I did. If we had sound effects right this, now, uh, I'd be playing like 80 rounds of applause in a row. You were so incredible. I, you always are. We, uh, we appreciate this is only this so the much. second appearance I've ever made on a televised thing. I'd like uh, for you to sign an exclusivity here. contract when, we, when we've when we completed recording. <laughs> Don't we want you, you all to ask me? Do you listen to any other podcasts? What did, we, what, did, what did we miss? What did, what did you want to oh, say? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me about like um, movies. Yeah. Don't you ask about that? We do favorites. Let's do it. What do you got? We want your favorites. What are you watching? Um... I'm not, you know, super normal when it comes to this kind of thing. I have some peculiar tastes. I like to watch documentaries. Hold, hold on. Yeah. Be careful. How what? peculiar? Well, I like to watch documentaries. Oh, I can't, okay. right. I can't, inv I, I tried to watch um, Slow Horses. It was really well acted. Duncan loves Love that. Gary Oldman. But like you get to a point where the action that's taking place is unbelievable. Like two people with pea shooters are, you know, killing all of these guys armed with automatic weapons. And it just so once it veers into stuff that's not believable for purposes of the dramatic narrative, I drop out. Okay. So I love watching really com the strangest things in life are true. So th uh, there are some documentaries I've seen recently, which are, are kind of amazing. What's your favorite? And are all. The one, I like to watch people who who are trying to find their parents or they're trying to find out their family history because it was cut off from them in some way. So there's this documentary called Sam Now, and it's on Criterion Channel, which is an app that you can get and watch movies. And it's about these two brothers that videotaped everything uh, when they were kids. So they have all the footage. And their mother just left when she was – when the kids were uh, like 15 and 17. She disappeared. Several years later, they go to try to find her. Like she's gone for over a decade. They try to find her and they find her. And they try to, on camera, get her to explain what she did and why she did it. And She was stuck in an ice cube like in True Detective. No, not at all. What happened? And Well, I don't want to spoil it. So, but it's fascinating. And, and they think they're unaffected by it. And then as the movie goes on, you can see the effect it had them. It's amazing. Um, and then another one was called My Architect about the architect Louis Kahn. And which is another, you know, another one, uh, a son that like didn't know his father. And then kind of after he died, you know, penniless in Grand Central Station, um, worked backwards to learn his story. And uh, what did he build? What did he build? The, the architect? He uh, he he was one of the most famous architects of the 20th century. He did the Jonas mm. Salk facility in California. Okay. He did the like the state house of Bangladesh, the one that's floating on the water. Some pretty amazing stuff. So I anyway. have to say that is very niche. Yeah, I know. But that's the stuff I really enjoy. You got a favorite for us? I have two. Um, I binge watched uh, Band of Brothers this week. Told you. Told you. Is that one of the best things you've ever seen in your life? Do you remember this from 2001? 2000, 2001. So th this came out two days before 9-11. Band of Brothers. It's it's the true story of uh, Easy Company in World War II. But, it was, but it's made by Spielberg and Hanks. So, so it's I just incredible. I was saying to Ben, the production quality there's a scene where there's bullets whizzing by in the night in one of the one of the episodes i can't remember which one and it seems so real i have yeah. no idea how they how they made that um i watched the first episode of griselda you see that not yet so griselda blanca was a gigantic drug dealer in miami and one of my favorite documentaries ever cocaine cowboys she is a prime character in that uh, in that documentary. This is like a dramatization of it. Yeah, and so uh, what's her name? Sofia Vergara. Yeah, she plays Griselda, and she was she's very good. Very yeah, convincing. And most people think of her more for her looks than her acting. She's. So a, I'm really she excited a, to she see that. Acted her, uh, you know what? Else? She was great. So I watched the Grammys Sunday night with my whole family. So there's two teenage kids, myself, my wife. My wife doesn't care at all about music. 
My daughter only listens to rap. My son only listens to whatever my daughter tells him is cool. And then I, I'm like a music polymath. I listen to literally everything. I feel like it's like one of the one of the better award shows, the Grammys, relative to the Oscars. And, it, and I ended up talking to like middle-aged friends of mine and randomly it came up. A group of five of us, we play tennis. Uh, randomly it came up. Every single one of them watched it. I don't know why because it's not like me and it's not like them. But I feel like music is now bigger than movies for most people in America, maybe around the world, bigger than TV shows. It's like probably the biggest pop form of pop culture that we still all share as Americans. And as a testament to that, every act that went on stage was from a different genre or a different generation. And the ratings were great. The Tracy and Chapman thing went nuts. So right, so Tracy Chapman had a had a Grammy award winning album and song in like nineteen eighty six or yeah. something, whatever it is. A guy we made it last year. It was the number one song again, and he duetted with her. He's a country artist. It was so cool to see. And then that song, her recording, became the number one song on Apple Music and Spotify the next day. So you know, I listened to it on Spotify the next day. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to just point out, like we talk about how fractionalized everything's become and there's like no shared culture anymore. This is a counter example that I hope we see more of. It really felt like everybody was watching and everybody had something to root for or to like during the show. Even if you wanted to root against Taylor Swift, who was there, of course, like you had something to root for and against but you still watched it and your neighbors watched it. And uh, I thought that was kind of a cool a cool moment. Hey Amen. One thing before we get out of here. Did you watch the most recent episode of True Detective? Yes. What the hell is going on? Dude, they're going what too- the f They're veering too supernatural for me, I like, feel like. I wanted to love it and they just- they, I mean, there's only two episodes left. I'll watch it, but they, it's- they, what happened? they turned it into like a- They turned it into like a ghost story. I don't know. I might weird. be out. It's weird. Well, it's two episodes. There's only six episodes. All so. right. Let's, 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 Michael, let's, thank you. Let's let Michael Amazing. get out of here. Uh, let's, let's tell people you're active on Twitter or you just, you're just like lurking. You don't talk on Twitter, do you? No, no, okay. but I, I, I'm active on uh, LinkedIn. On LinkedIn. LinkedIn. I post and all my friends in LinkedIn. Okay. And I, <laughs> and no I, only fans. I have an Instagram account, but that's just my fishing adventures. Is it like, can anybody follow you? Your yes. fishing stuff? Yes. Do you have other fishing people like following you on there? Yes, I let, think. Let me back up. You yeah. do real fishing trips. This is not like you off the dock in your backyard. You no. go places. No, no. For instance, I, in last October, uh, I went kayak fishing for sturgeon in yeah. British Columbia. And we yeah. caught some like six and eight foot sturgeon. Uh, I have, I go kayak fishing for tarpon in Trinidad. Okay. Or Yellowtail and La Jolla do a lot of fishing on Long Island, right. so I'm really into it. So the anglers that listen to our podcast would probably love <laughs> to check that out. I have some great pictures and videos <laughs> that they would like to see. Okay. Uh, everybody follow Michael Semblist on LinkedIn. Michael, we want to thank you so much for your time. It's just been such an honor and a pleasure, and I hope we can do this again. And on behalf of all of your readers out there, and I know there are many, thank you for all the work that you do each month. It's incredible. And we all get so much out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Good to much. to see you guys again. All right. We're going to wrap it up. Hey, Compounders, make sure you uh, do the ratings and the reviews on all the platforms. Do all the things. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for watching out in YouTube land. We will see you soon.